talk is uh, going to be uh, by, uh, conducted by Dr. S. M. Sena Naika, a consultant gastroenterologist uh, from Teaching Hospital Kalutara. And Dr. Sena Naika is going to talk to us on evaluation and management of clinically significant portal hypertension. Over to you, Dr. Sena Naika. Right. Um, so the topic given to me actually is the evaluation and management of clinically significant portal hypertension. It's really, um, there is a new guideline called the Babano uh, 7. So this actually topic actually was decided by Professor Nidhiyala really to cover this new guideline. First of all, what is Babano? Babano is apparently a very beautiful scenic town in Italy. And why is it relevant to us? That is, it happens to be the place that always that the, you, that the guideline committee go to decide and discuss portal hypertension. So this is actually the consensus statement that my whole talk is based on revenue seven, which is renew, renewing its consensus in portal hypertension. And the whole um, ethos of it is to give a personalized care to portal hypertension. So why they always keep going to Bavano, we don't know. It must be for some academic complicated reason. So the overview of this guideline talk is about uh, talking about a hepatic venous special gradient to use to um, uh, measure portal hypertension and the different non-invasive tests that we can use and how to prevent the first episode of decompensation in a serotic patient and uh, the impact of uh, uh, etiological and non-etiological therapy on the course of cirrhosis and how to manage an acute bleed if there's anything new that revenue tells us and how to prevent something called further decompensation. So to quickly get into the crux of the matter, portal hypertension rather than hepatocyte failure per se is responsible for most of the complications. Now, usually patients will say, do I have cirrhosis? Uh, they will say, or how much is resolved? So actually, the fact is not really the hepatocyte failure, it's portal hypertension, which is the um, driver of all the compl complications and the mor morbidity and mortality. So hepatic venous special gradient, we can do invasive as we have all been taught during our undergraduate time, is the gold standard to measure portal hypertension. The portal hypertension is the problem here and what we're trying to tackle with this talk. So here we can realize that as the portal hypertension increases, we get complications. So at 10, we get 10 millimeters mercury, you get varices, you get ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, increased risk of um, decompensation, mortality, recurrently. So here, now they have identified this cutoff, which is more than, more than 10, is considered a, a crucial watershed moment. And from this point onward, it shows, has prognostic information about, and for this we call clinically significant portal hypertension. So that's what this topic is about, clinically significant portal hypertension, more than 10 millimeters mercury. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this again because the topic really talks about the clinical significant portal hypertension. Once we hit the point of 10, you get viruses or the complications. So 10 or more is detected as clinical significant portal hypertension. So next, our goal is to try to detect this and if possible, to treat clinical significant portal hypertension. Now the problem is, that what I showed you already is an invasive test. So the holy grail of hepatology has been to find non-invasive tests that we can diagnose. And even simple things like platelet counts less than 100 strongly suggest. But actually what we are trying to do is find other measures of cirrhosis, which is actually a histological diagnosis. What we're trying to do is find liver sickness measurements using, uh, using different modalities. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of modalities available, but transient elastography is the one which is most available. And out of that as well, five to ten is the one which is most validated and used in flash. So what is a fiber scan? So a fiber scan is an, like an ultrasound machine, but it's sort of a simple ultrasound machine. It shoots one beam of ultrasound uh, wave and it goes through the liver and depending how stiff the liver is, we will get a reading. So this is revolutionized hepatology because for a change, now we don't have to go behind Radio is begging for early scan days, we can do it ourselves. And you can see how happy the gastroenterologist is in the future. So with this, we get a simple reading. For example, on, on your left on your left side, you can see a 
normal liver and the reading is 3.5 because it is not stiff. Whereas in a cirrhotic liver, the reading is 33.3, which is, is stiffer. So fibrous scan is used for two things, not only to detect, first of all, it is used to detect liver fibrosis. So the primary is the device to find liver fibrosis. And now we are using it as a non-invasive marker to detect clinically significant portal hypertension, which we are talking about today. So just before we go to portal hypertension, we have talked about how we detect liver fibrosis. If we take a patient with fatty liver disease, you can see this is course will go to one to five, healthy liver, fatty liver, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and cancer. So what happens is now we have a fibro scan or anonymous markers we can monitor and at one point we will detect patients who have early fibrosis. So this point on the patient is at risk of hepatic cellular carcinoma long-term mortality. So this point on which is defined by this new term, which is compensated advanced chronic liver disease. So what is this? It is a broad term which includes, is similar to compensated cirrhosis, but because we have modalities to detect early fibrosis, this includes early patients who will have advanced fibrosis, but not over cirrhosis. So these are the Bevan six. This is what when they met last time, what they thought of. So they use the, these liver cutoffs, liver stiffness less than 10, rules out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. More than 15, highly suggestive, and 10 to 15 is suggestive. So the next question is you may be running to is do all patients with fatty liver disease, for example, need a fiber scan? The answer is no. We have other simpler tests and easily available tests such as the PIP course for which is the Calculation we do with simple basic tests that you can see on a smartphone. And from this, we can either rule out uh, or if we suspect with higher value, we can refer the patient for a, um, we can refer the patient for a fibro scan. So how does fibro scan help in, in, in monitoring clinically significant port hypertension? So these are the cause of Now we can, if the liver stiffness is low and the platelet count is high, more than 150, it rules out clinical significant portal hypertension. Ordinarily, if the liver stiffness is more than 25, that per se is sufficient to diagnose clinical significant portal hypertension. We do not need a endoscopy per se to diagnose. And if it's in between these two values, we use these cutoffs, and they are associated with about 60% likelihood of clinical significant portal hypertension. So this is actually summarized summary slide, which is uh, supposed to make our life easier. So it's called the rule of five. As you can see, less than five, it excludes. Um, more than 15, it makes clinical significant uh, compensated advanced liver is more likely. And as we go, it also keeps the values for clinical significant total hypertension, according to Bevan of seven. So uh, hybrid scan is a new toy, so gastroenterologists like to play around with it, so they don't look at just the stiffness of the liver. They also have checked the stiffness of the spleen. And similarly, using these cutoffs, we can use the splenic stiffness to diagnose or exclude clinical significant portal hypertension. Now, you may be asking, now what happens after detecting clinically significant portal hypertension? What is, what is the what what is the what is the use if cirrhosis is usually considered? A progressive disease, and we can't do anything about it. So actually, there are trials which have shown that if, if because the portal hypertension is the driver of the disease, if we reduce the portal hypertension, whether we can reduce the long-term complication. So this is a sort of a new trial called Predisky beta blockers to prevent decompensation in cirrhosis in patients with clinically significant portal hypertension. So it's a randomized one done in Spain. Uh, eight hospitals, but actually it's uh, only for 200 patients, but there are epidemiologic special cases have been checked. And what they found is with patients on beta blockers, propranol or carbidolol were found to have a list uh, incidence of complications, mainly aside. So on that basis, there is a impression that long-term treatment with beta blockers could increase the decompensation free survival. You prevent decompensation by, by prophylactically giving beta blockers. So in this, actually, the, all the question that you may be running to ask is propranol or carbidol. So finally, after many, many long years, the ESL committee has agreed that carbidol is the preferred uh, beta blocker over propranol.
and LOL. We've been using it for many years in Sri Lanka, but here now we do have evidence. Why? Because it's more effective, it reduces pressure in a greater extent, it has better survival, and, it, and of course it has better tolerability than uh, So this is actually a free change. I hope you appreciate what they're talking about. Previous year, only patients who have very seriously given B2. But now with 7 and 7, even if we don't have varices, if we have clinically significant portal hypertension, there is an indication to treat with beta blockers, and this is to prevent decompensation. The next question you may be thinking about is, do all cirrhotic patients still need an endoscope? The answer is not really. So if a patient who is very compensated, the patient in many cases will need uh, endoscopy. But a patient who is compensated, we can check the plated counts and do a part. Fiber scan. There, if the plated count is more than 150 and the liver stiffness is less than 20, this makes varices very unlikely and therefore they do not need endoscopy according to revenue uh, 7. But of course, we, they need to repeat this non invasive test um, uh, yearly. What else can we do in cirrhotic patients? We can remove any etiological agents, rarely. So basically, if it's a hepatitis C patient, Removing a treatment or hepatitis C patients, treatment can really improve uh, cirrhosis patients. The similar thing happens when we stop alcohol and the patient goes into a long term abstinence. Not so important, but still something we have to remember weight loss and we have to deal with obesity, diabetes, those are also important things. It won't help as much as uh, patients stopping alcohol completely, but they also are, have to be addressed in the long term management. So, with the suppression of the primary etiological agent, patients can improve. This is actually termed as a recompensation. Basically, you can have resolution of ascites or diabetic, resolution of hepatic encephalopathy, absence of valsal bleeding. So this is seen after you treat patients with hepatitis C and B, and we have seen this actually even in the periphery. And this is just one of my patients, uh, not the same patient I'm showing, but he had crossed the ascites, and on the right side, you can see after six months of abstinence, uh, this is completely resolved, and you can see he's a new patient uh, simply because of abstinence of alcohol. So, what are the other treatments that we can give which may, may benefit portal hypertension? How about statins? Now, everybody used to be scared of statins previously, but now we find that statins should be encouraged in patients with cirrhosis. Encouraged in patients with cirrhosis. Still, there is no in indication to give for cirrhosis per se, but they do have. An indication of statins, we should really encourage them. And this is because they have been shown to reduce portal hypertension and may improve overall survival. So we must have a low threshold starting setting. There is any indication. So is it safe in decompensated cirrhosis? We need to monitor more carefully. And if it is child B or C, we can still give statins, but we should give maybe a lower dose. And similar setting is the one which has been used predominantly. Sir. How about aspirin? Right? So normally a lot of people will run away from aspirin with cirrhosis, the places come down. But in early cirrhosis, we should not discourage patients from taking because it has been shown to reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, reduce liver-related complications as well. Of course, post banding we have to be careful because the risk of post banding also is. There has been a controversy about giving albumin because some trials are there which show that recurrent albumin infusion may be beneficial. But some there is Alternative evidence that shows that there is no benefit. So at the moment, with the Bavano 7 stays away from this discussion and says there is no evidence to recommend either way. But of course, we know what, what we should definitely give albumin, which is for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, acute kidney injury, when if we do a large volume parasynthesis, and also hepatorenal syndrome combined with telephone. So other treatment that you can save the life of the patient prophylactically would be to give SPP prophylaxis. If they have had SPP, of course, we would give prophylaxis. Also, as you know, now there are patients who may need primary prophylaxis. What this is, is if the patients have ascites and have very low levels of albumin, low levels of protein in the acidic fluid, they are at higher risk of bacterial transplantation and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So we would treat them with norfloxacin. But it's only for patients who have severe disease, defined by child who weighs more than nine, children more than three, with renal impairment. 
that was who should we give the vaccine to long term? It is for patients who have had hepatic encephalopathy and we can use it like antibody prophylaxis to, to prevent recurrent hepatic encephalopathy in patients who have already had hepatic encephalopathy. So a few words about acute variceal bleed. As you can see, these are all patients uh, from Karutsara and uh, they are as dramatic as they appear on your screen. Yeah, so there's actually a video as you can see. I like to just show the point. There is a there's a bleeding point at 12 o'clock position, and you can see that blood is squirting from that position. And and I hope you will appreciate. Um, I don't have a pointer here. You can see that. You can see that um, at the top there is blood is just pouring out. So this is the real acute periseal bleed. And we have to know how to take care of it and how to save the lives of our patients. So, not many new things in Bavenu Severan. Volume resuscitation is important. We have to give uh, volume re expansion and to maintain the human dynamic capability. I've seen so many patients in ANE just with a drip going slowly. It's just not going to make it. If you have a patient who is bleeding, like I showed you in this video, you can appreciate how much fluid we have to give and maintain the patient's blood pressure till we can get in and stop the bleeding. Yes, we have conservative levels for transfusion, seven to eight, but this is in a stable patient, and also we have to take other factors like age, hemodynamic status, and we have to reassess if there is ongoing bleeding. Antibody prophylaxis, ceftriaxone is life-saving, just like endoscopy, and also intubation if uh, the patient altered consciousness, of course, in Sri Lanka, this is a fantasy, as I think most of our audience will appreciate. But what we can do is urgent endoscopy. Now, this is the same pictures of the same patient that I have I, I have shown in the video. And you can see that the vessel is just squirting and there's continuous bleeding. So although aperture should be done within 12 hours of presentation, this is not a rule. So at least if the patient is unstable, it should be done as soon as possible to save because um, this patient actually we have, have banded and we have banded within about four or five hours. And he, he did fine, but I don't think he would have survived if he had waited for a whole, overnight or for 12 hours with that rate of bleeding. A uh, few new things. A um, few new things. Pre endoscopy, uh, erythromycin, erythromycin is helpful to give us a clear field, and ideally, we should have a 24 hour team which is able to handle such cases. Although, as you said, in the current scenario, it's uh, really becoming more fantastic. We should treat with band ligation. So I, I hope you appreciate that ligation has been done and we have caused the bleeding site of the barracks. It's very, very important because just going and putting bands where you can see is not going to help. We need to find the site of bleeding and get a band to show the bleeding. Um, and of course, for fundal viruses, we do uh, sign away uh, for IGV2, one type of you can consider uh, ligation or do. And there's a new thing of human spray, which we use in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, it cannot be recommended as a, as a first line therapy, according to them. Few small things about epipersal bleeding. Um, nutrition uh, status uh, is worst problem. Therefore, oral nutrition, we should try to start as soon as possible. And also, this is a very useful guideline. All patients who have an acute periceal bleed should undergo abdominal imaging ultrasound, ideally CT, because as I see, they have suddenly decompensated. So that may be due to hepatitis transformer or portable thrombosis. So we need to do an abdominal imaging as part of the workup of an acute peritoneal bleed patient. How about acute peritoneal bleed and encephalopathy? Now, you know that the moment patient bleeds very soon, in a few hours, within the day, that may precipitate encephalopathy. And if the patient becomes unconscious, it becomes difficult. We can't put a tube to do the endoscope next patient will have aspiration pneumonia and die, you know, match over. So we have to really on the ball to get the endoscope early, stop the bleeding and treat encephalopathy if he is going into encephalopathy. So Bavino 7 recommends lactuose as well as enema and it encourages the rapid removal of the blood from the gastrointestinal tract will prevent the septic uh, Of course, if your patient has had Bicycle bleed is very important. We should give them a combination of, of beta blockers, usually carbidolol, and recurrent band ligation on a bicycle education program, not just one. 
So all good things must come to an end. So when should beta blockers be stopped? When the patient is sort of far gone, prostatitis, if they're having low blood pressure, going into AKI, this is not the time to continue beta blockers. I've seen so many patients still on carbidol, high doses. When the blood pressure is starting to drop, creatine is going up, then it's the time to stop beta blockers and go into a planning, planning program to make sure the patient doesn't bleed as a result. Of course, it's the improve, of course, we can restart it. There's one more concept to I quickly cover, something called further decompensation. Further decompensation is represents a prognostic stage with an even higher mortality than first decompensation. So this is how it's defined. If the patient has a second portal hypertension given uh, decompensating event, like a second ascites, Baricel bleed, hepatic encephalopathy, or going late into jaundice, it's considered further decompensation. Um, if the patient has recurrent baricel bleeding, recurrent ascites, recurrent encephalopathy, this is also further decompensation um, and, and has very poor prognosis. And also, patients say they came with bleeding, but as the bleeding was improving, at a late stage, they go into ascites or jaundice. So, that is also defined as called further decompensation. And, it, and actually, patients will need to be considered for transplant and further management. So this is actually an overview of Webinar uh, 7. And uh, as you can see, it has made life a little bit more complicated for those who are trying to understand the piece. So this, this is the phase of late decom further decompensation and the patient can deteriorate. So very few take home mess messages. Portal hypertension rather than hepatitis failure per se is responsible for complications and the mortality. Clinically significant port hypertension, that is uh, pressure greater than 10, may has prognostic significance. It may be detected early with new non-invasive methods, including fibrocin. These patients should be considered for treatment early with carbidol as a first-line therapy, which may prevent them from going further and deeper. And statins are friends, not foes. And so I think I'm on time. And um, I would like to gratefully acknowledge Professor Anupad Desanayake, Professor Madhuri Jaya, and Dr. Nilanga for their, their help and assistance in this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. <coughs> My very dear friend, uh, Dr. Mananjara Senayake. Uh, there is uh, one question. <coughs> I will just take one question. Are proton pump inhibitors indicated following variceal bleeding? Uh, Mananjal, if yeah. you can uh, give your answer to that, please. Thank you. Yes, I, I think in our setting, it is indicated. I think it is indicated. Uh, internationally, there is a trend to stopping proton pump inhibitors. I think that there are different reasons. There may be side specific quantity um, uh, of patient and things like that. But um, yeah, it's a controversial topic. But personally, I think it is indicated because in our setting, we do, uh, in the Bevanov guideline, actually, they, they don't encourage the use of Omiprazole. Uh, they say that they, that they, that, uh, they sort of discourage you. However, I, I don't think we have to accept everything per se. After banding, we see lots of patients who get post banding or bleeding. I mean, uh, for, a, for, a, for a year, I have seen about two three or four. So we feel strongly, as I think all the whole gastroenterology community, I think is behind this, that we should be giving, be giving proton pump energy, not indefinitely by any means, but for the first two weeks, I, I would give for the first month because there is a risk of post banding ulcer. When the band falls, you get an ulcer on the very sick. So sometimes patients do bleed. Uh, and and uh, though we think it's a minor bleed, reality patients can have, have terrible consequences. So I would encourage definitely to give, but I acknowledge that worldwide there is a movement to not giving uh, PPIs, and uh, definitely we should be giving PPIs unnecessary for patients, long term for sure. It's mainly in the post planning stage with the patient. I hope that is uh, reasonable. I, I think my, my friend Hassan might have you uh, able to add uh, more to that. But, uh, right, thank you very much. Uh, so we wish to present you with a certificate of appreciation, Dr. Thank you very much for <clears throat> joining this program today. I'm very grateful.